I've been writing um, all my life, it seems. Not, not like I do today, but it, it just is... Um, all my life isn't accurate. As an adult, I have, I have worked for newspapers and um, written columns for the World Herald, and for your weekly column for the Lincoln Star. Um, uh, probably for the past 15 years I've been writing essays. I mean, I have a stack that high. I just write. It's part of, that's my connection. I never think of the audience, ever. Um, and I only write one thing, and I know this is boring, and we, in, in our writing group, we try to practice doing dialogues and, and doing different kind of stories and things, but I just write first-person nonfiction essays. I mean, obviously nonfiction. My book is called Women in Aging, Celebrating Ourselves. And um, the message I suspect is twofold. Um, I'm really disturbed at how aging women are considered and treated in the culture in the United States today. And I think we're perhaps not going to change that real soon. So I think that as they age, women have to take a lot of affirmative action in order to feel good about themselves. Um, otherwise, we are going to think that who our culture reflects back to us is who we're supposed to be. Young, thin, um, rich, heterosexually coupled, I mean, there are all sorts of things that we get and, and from television and magazines and newspapers and billboards and store windows. Yeah, it just, it just goes on and on. So uh, the last third of the book is what can we do about it, the kinds of actions that we can take to overcome um, that constant barrage of you're not supposed to age, old is bad, do ever, spend all your energy trying to stay young. I've had just, just entirely wonderfully positive things about my book. Just, and I, what I have to remember is that, that my book is supposed to go to, to the place or to the person where it can be heard or where they can resonate with it, and that's the point. You know, it's supposed to find its own places in this world. It's fun to be in the Heritage Room. Years ago, when I was active with friends of Lauren Isley, um, we had lots of activities here, and it's a delightful, wonderful place. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is perhaps not what you came to hear. Um, I'm not going to read from my book. I hope that you will do that yourself. Um, I will tell you a little bit about my book, Women in Aging, Celebrating Ourselves. What I did to write this book was become old. And I don't say that with any sense of disparagement, but you do know that we don't call anybody old in this country because that's a bad word. We have all these euphemisms for old, as if the natural progression of our lives were something we should fight against every minute. And I think particularly women are encouraged, encouraged, lashed, to fight against looking old, um, gaining weight, um, not being financially independent, um, on and on. Uh, one other quick thing I want to do. I don't know if anybody ever reads somebody else's work at these. Um, but this is one of my favorite books on women and aging. It's an anthology put together by Calix. This is the old one. I don't think the new anthology by Calix is very good, or it isn't as good as this one. There's a poem in here by a woman named Elizabeth Weber, who I just met the other night, who lives in Lincoln now. And she said, well, maybe you know that book. And of course I know this book. I thought backwards and forwards. But I ran home and looked up Elizabeth Weber's poem. And it's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever read about aging. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to start with that. It's called My Grandmother's Hands. In the cracked October morning, I watched my hands rim the edge of the pail. Numb with the hard tap water, they redden as the sky does. When did this happen? My hands become furrowed like an old burr oak, an after image of yours. How clearly I see your slow body thicken into the light, haloed by the hollyhocks as you etch your way to the coop. My fledgling hand held tight in the sinew and bone clutch of yours. 
At five, I cluck to you like one of the hens you won't let me touch, for fear I'll become as marked as you. You speak of yourself as a coat ready for the junk heap, and not that Polish daughter I saw pictured once high on a hayrick, the men looped around you. Did you think you could keep the world from flicking its knife-edged tongue at me any more than yourself? At 30 and alone, I'm world-bitten. These hands you worked so hard to save, scarred as old barn wood and dry as the husks of corn blown by September. They do what they must do, as yours did, and I won't mourn their passing youth. When do we learn to hate age? To think of it not as growth, but as a falling away? This curse notched in us so tightly there is no forgiveness for what is only the self becoming the self. My hair grays into a mirror of yours. One day I will lie down next to you, my hands dissolving into your hands. Isn't that my self, only the self becoming the self? <laughs> Hurrah. <laughs> well, the one about my mother is called Not a, Very, uh, Not a Very Easy Death, and that's a wordplay on Simone de Beauvoir's A Very Easy Death, which is the ironic title of her memoir of her, of her mother's death. Um, I write my way through things, and so it's just how I wrote my way through my mother's death a year ago. Well, I'm not sure it's cathartic, but it's uh, sometimes how I know where I am. But I don't do it for any reason other than that's how I get through things. Some people knit a sweater and then rip it all out and knit it all over again. Or some people clean the basement. You know, it's just, that's just my way. What I'm going to read is a long piece entitled, Not a Very Easy Death. So you'll just have to bestir yourself. I'm just, I thought, oh, it's way too long to read, but I am going to read it, so you'll have to keep yourself awake. Um, this took place a year ago. Old Cat Harrison died, put to sleep, as we say, at our veterinarians late on a Thursday afternoon. I wept for his 19 years. The next Thursday night, my sister called from California to tell me that a CAT scan of mother's liver showed a large cancerous tumor. The doctor said she had one to two months to live. In the next few days, her sentence went to two weeks and then to by next Wednesday. By the time my husband and I and our three daughters rendezvoused at the San Francisco airport the following weekend, I'd arranged to be gone a week, been surprised by frequent headaches and stomach aches, experienced enormous anxiety, and gotten much advice from friends about death and dying. I'd also eaten an entire package of waffle cream cookies, each bite a childhood memory. Mother was alert and respons responsive when we got to the hospital in Santa Rosa that Saturday. I had driven the five of us, giddy from this unexpected reunion, north from the airport, getting on a wrong highway, frustrated in big city traffic, afraid the whole way she'd die before we got there. But there she was, sitting up in bed, smiling at us, opening her arms, overwhelmed by the continual presence of so many children, stepchildren, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren visiting. My husband went out and bought her his usual huge bouquet of long-stemmed red roses. She beamed, knowing they were her due, and announced, they are our identification, which pleased him enormously. She was aware of the roses for only a few minutes. Her short-term memory under the circumstances, her short-term memory had been failing for years and now was worse under the circumstances of cancers that we knew and knew not, drugs and barely any nourishment. One of our big subjects of conversation was how much insure she had managed to get down in a day. I felt sentenced to what I knew not as my daughters and husband left in a few days to return to their lives. The niece I knew best, she and I, buddies and compatriots for years, left in a few days too. The last eight years had been surely too much for my strong mother. Her husband's massive strokes, her insistence that she take care of him, four cancer operations on the body that had not been in a hospital except to have children uh, before her 78th year cataract surgeries, a stroke, a mild heart attack, putting her husband in a home to relieve herself of some of his care, 
all of this intertwined with selling a house, moving, building a house, selling it, moving into an apartment, investing their money, and worst of all, living through the three-year dying of cancer of my oldest sister. Mother resisted any chemotherapy or radiation, having watched those cures wreck my sister's body. So this latest news, a tumor in her liver, was greeted by mother with courage and resignation. This time she would die too old and tired for another operation, asking only that she not be in pain. She said to me often over the next days, I've never done this before, which I took to mean died, and to which I always responded, neither have we, mother, hoping that together we'd find some common thread through this bewildering experience. I came to know that my mother was afraid to be alone, certainly one of the things that dying is. I might have figured that out, reasoning from her off-the-charts extroversion, evidenced in my life by mothers forever urging us to join her in visiting with anyone available. People found her charming and friendly. My sisters and I never had any permission to nurture our introverted sides. At my sister's direction, the IV was taken out of my mother's arm in the hospital, where it had been put to restore the electrolyte balance in her body to relieve her of hallucinations. I never knew if her later hallucinations came from the morphine, a possible tumor in her brain, or from that imbalance caused by not enough food or water. She had hardly eaten at all since last spring after her second mastectomy, although she had never been a big eater and was the slowest eater on the planet. She didn't consciously try not to eat, she just wasn't hungry anymore. At some level, she's decided to die. We went around saying to each other, not knowing beans about it, really. My sister Anne had been mother's aide de camp for years and thus in charge of the medical decisions at her death and dying. They had talked this all through, I assumed. Anne had been with mother for every hospitalization and had included her in every holiday with her family ran her errands, took her shopping, and cared for her in countless ways I could only guess at. Anne and mother's husband of 29 years barely endured one another. Joseph was now being taken care of in the home of one of his daughters, no longer a factor in my sister's life with mother except as a focus for her anger, part of which was over mother's wearing herself out taking care of him. The days blurred as I joined Anne in caring for and sitting with mother. Anne's five children and their children paid visits from their California homes, and soon everyone had come and gone, and it was just us. My sister, Anne, and me, and her husband, Kay, and our grief. Mother required no treatment, so the hospital discharged her to the quiet and order of my sister's guest bedroom. Hospice sent the bed and other equipment, and Anne had some things from Mother's apartment moved to her guest bedroom. To give mother a sense of home, Anne repeated over and over again, anxious, I guess, to know that mother felt at home. While she was in the hospital, mother's stepson read poetry to her. The report was that she loved it, and she calmed down as she heard Dwight's voice reading the old poems. I tried to do the same from Dwight's anthology, which was left at her bedside. So many of the poems dealt with death, and there was always a strange struggle to know what mother wanted to hear, this woman I'd known for 60 years. Once I read some Robert Frost to her, over and over again trying to avoid the death of the hired man. Um, I read my favorites to her, little ones, realizing that I was reading Frost not for my mother, but for myself. We had a rousing evangelical time at her bedside one day when I found her daytime health care aide meditating on his Bible. He read to her, I immediately countered with the 23rd Psalm, and asked him to find the Beatitudes in his Bible. Mother was a reader for years in her Christian Science Church, so she knew her Bible well. The one I found to read from was one of her old reader books with large print and still feel filled with the thin steel markers and blue chalk notations that marked that week's lesson. How long ago had that lesson been marked in her Bible, I wondered. The AIDS version of the Beatitudes seemed unlike anything I'd ever heard before, and he read way too long, not knowing how to stop, I guess. 
He came only twice more, so we didn't again pursue overt religious ceremonies at Mother's bedside. My favorite bedside memory is the night that Anne and Kay and I all felt specially uneasy that this might be the night Mother died. I went back to their house in my nightgown and robe, and the three of us spent more than an hour sitting around Mother, using her name, talking, reminiscing about things in her life, funny things, things we remembered as children, things we knew would please her to hear. In the hospital, Mother had exaggerated her lifelong and very severe penchant for absolute order and tidiness by folding and refolding the top of the sheet. Once she rearranged all the things on her portable sw swing table, saying, there, after each placement, and then doing it all over again. Deep inside her, she was trying to arrange things, to have some effect on her world, to control and make sure everything was in its place. By the time we were doing vigil in Anne's house, Mother had moved the sheet folding back to the years that she sewed skirts for us. Anne remembered Mother sewing plaid back to school skirts, and Mother sat in her bed trying to match material, thinking the top sheet and the blanket were the skirt fabric pieces. Within 48 hours after my family gathered at Mother's bedside, Anne and the doctor elected to give her morphine, which takes the person away from you. A difficult person to read a pain level from anyway, Mother spent the lifetime that I knew her saying, I'm fine, darling blinking her eyes as she smiled and tilting her head up and quite possibly always meaning it. She also insisted we not dwell on anything unpleasant. Who is to know what pain level existed inside her? From cancer cells, from not eating, from a liver of reduced function, from a bladder not working, from what else? I was grateful she was doped up with morphine the day the ambulance company moved her from hospital to home. Through some ghastly computer screw-up, the medical aides took her back to her apartment complex, pushing the gurney through the large front lobby, across the atrium, and up the elevator to her door. Finally, one of the people at the front desk realized a mistake had been made and raced after the men, redirecting them to my sister's house. Mother never knew, even though she was awake and smiling throughout this ordeal. She hadn't wanted her friends to see her sick and did not go to meals for several weeks before her final dying began. Some words and thoughts and surprises that pushed their way through the terrible, terrible tiredness that was my constant companion in those next weeks. Wanting to scream at the golf, golf, golfers in mother's retirement area, don't you know my mother is dying? How dare you go on as if nothing were wrong? collapsing into sobs of grief the first night I stayed in her apartment, shocking myself by wailing over and over again, I want my mommy, something I have no memory of ever having said before. Becoming weary of hearing advice from people to tell mother to let go, to tell her to go toward the light, all of which we had said to her time and time again, and weary of the well-meant question, have you said everything you need to tell her? Is she waiting for someone to get here, for you to say something to her? My sister Anne's relief from grief and tension was, I think, having to keep on doing ordinary household chores. She was the major domo of this entire business. She did laundry, fixed meals, greeted each shift change, answered the telephone, and she and Kay kept the house spotless. Ironing was her favorite stress reliever, I decided as I sat and visited with her while she carefully and expertly ironed everything. Watching Anne perform this ancient household ritual calmed and soothed even me. A Kadu family ritual is to rent a movie and eat popcorn on Friday nights. With wildly varying movie taste, we picked one I liked on a Friday night and no one watched it. The next week, Anne and Kay chose Home Alone, a really stupid, Silly story, not on my list to see. But there we were, not knowing what to do, waiting, fighting the terror of losing mother who was now not conscious nor lucid much. During the movie, I thought to go check on mother in her room down the hall. I was startled to become dizzy and disoriented as I moved between the world of watching a Friday night movie and the world of my mother dying. Going back and forth between those worlds was bizarre, and sometimes I'm swept with sadness 
at the memory. A good friend said, at least you could have been watching a good movie. And I laughed hard in relief. One day I went to have a massage and knew I was at the right place when I came into a room with low lights, music, incense, crystals, images of goddesses, and the gentle expert hands of a woman therapist. She told me she did hospice work with people with AIDS and women without birthing partners. Both experiences, those of birth and dying, she found to be remarkably similar. This information soothed me and affirmed what I'd come to know being with mother, that dying is hard work. There are, of course, lives that end in an instant, health and activity present right up to the last breath. But for conscious deaths like that of my mother's, it must be hard work. Maybe her death was hard since her nature was so fierce. She is a fighter, everyone who knew her said. So did she automatically struggle with death? She seemed anxious to be done with this bewildering time quite a few days before her heart stopped beating and her lungs took their last gasp of air. Strong-minded and exquisitely organized, Mother had arranged her finances, her legal affairs, everything in the past years. The days alternated between okay and terrible. I said to my friend Nan on the telephone, well, today is awful, so tomorrow will be better. Perhaps not, Ruthie, she counseled. That's the nature of suffering. In all honesty, I came to believe that 85 was too young to die, the same way I had felt when old Cat Harrison died two weeks before, not old enough to die at 19. The trees out the porch doors off the living room were changing shades much too early, Anne's husband and I agreed. In a bookstore next to a coffee place, my hand fell on Simone de Beauvoir's A Very Easy Death, which I'd yet read years ago and forgotten. Rereading it brought some comfort during these days and weeks of our own vigil. Mother was embarrassed to have anyone see her scarred body when we or the age changed her nightgowns, and more chagrined to be diapered after the hospice nurses put a catheter in and drained her bursting bladder. Oddly enough, a full bladder was causing her terrible agitation, not some spiritual crisis, as I thought. We watched the stages of dying described by hospice. Clammy skin, blue fingertips, longer time between breaths, racing breaths, cold feet and hands. Counting mother's breaths, I'd unconsciously fall into monitoring my own breathing rhythm. Rubbing her feet one day, I could hardly stand the thought that this body would soon be burned up, that these feet would no longer exist, that this body would be reduced to ashes filled with bone fragments. When I got back to her apartment at night, I would find get well cards stuck under the door and winced that she was beyond knowing or perhaps even caring about her friends, even though we read the mail to her. Trouble is, these moments of her knowing were no longer connected. So we all could say, goodbye, I love you, and then say it again. I wanted to say to the well-wishers, she's not going to get well, she's dying. They knew that. I said to my sister one day, after a Sunday when an aide and a grandson lifted her into a wheelchair and lifted the wheelchair out onto the porch where she seemed to enjoy looking at some rangy blue flowers, that everyone caring for her could be horses for all the distinctions she was no longer able to make between us. Although, in retrospect, I know she saved for me that too casual, quick, hello, dear, look that had always been her greeting of me. My sister Anne had a dream several weeks earlier that mother would die at 10 to 5 in the early morning. Early one morning, I awoke in her apartment to the sound of a key opening the front door. I raised up and struggled to call out Anne. There was no answer, and I assumed Anne and Kay were, had come over to tell me that Mother had died. Someone came on down the hall and into the bedroom. There was no one, so I shook myself awake, looked at the clock, it was 10 of 5, and figured Mother had died and Anne and Kay would be calling soon. The telephone didn't ring, and rather uneasily, I went back to sleep. She did not die that day, but had appeared the night before to be in the throes of death. She threw her body back and made struggling sounds, and I yelled for my sister Anne. After several minutes, Mother quieted. The visitation at the apartment was early the next morning. Why had she come to the apartment? 
I, atheist and admirer of Bertrand Russell, wondered. To get something? To check on how everything was? To tell me something? I posed these questions tentatively, not even sure that they represent reality. Yet I had never experienced such a thing and was quite clear that it was not an ordinary dreaming state, but a more lucid presence. Later we figured that even though her body stayed alive a while after that, her spirit had left early that morning. During these last days at her bedside, we read the morning paper or hospice tracts, dozed, jumped up and down trying to get mother comfortable, spooned an eyedropper water into her mouth, tried to guess what she needed or wanted from her every movement and sound. At this point, her, her point of view was obviously very different from ours. She'd been growing further and further away from us, more interested in the details and the enormity of dying than she was interested in us. We said to one another since her second mastectomy some five months before that she seemed to be somewhere else a lot of the time. What that surmise consisted of was that she slept a lot more and talked less, sometimes sitting and thinking, awake and eyes focused beyond the immediate room, only superficial interest in our conversation. Although I remember in August telling her I was going to see a local production of Harvey, the next day she asked me how it was telling me how she had always loved that play. Sometimes we whispered and sometimes we talked too loudly like people who are embarrassed or unsure of themselves. Taking seriously life after life stories, sometimes we directed our comments to a corner of the room at the ceiling. One day an aide put pink lipstick on mother's pale face, wanting her to be fixed up. I endured that bizarre sight for only a few minutes and wiped the lipstick off. A favorite family story describes my mother putting on her lipstick, blotting it nearly off, and seriously inquiring of us if she had too much on. The fanciful act of the aid reminded me of embalming, which was not the choice of our family in life or death. We held her hands and stroked her and rubbed her head and tried to find that spot that her hands constantly floated toward as if to scratch. We wondered where she was and were especially distressed when her eyes rolled back in her head. We tried to cool her off and to keep her warm. Her burning skin, I thought, might have been the beginning of uremic poisoning before the catheter drained her bladder. We pointed out to her the mountains beyond the street in front of Anne's house and told her the sun was shining, the wind was blowing, the crows were cawing. We told her over and over again not to be concerned that she was soiling the sheets. Ever proper, beyond Victorian, Mother could not bear any mention or discussion of the body's functions. In days past, we'd tease her about her Puritan nature. For most of the days, I repeated over and over again to her, the everlasting arms of love beneath, around, above, words that she had raised us on from Mary Baker Eddy, words that I thought would comfort her and which certainly did me. Anne and Kay and I spent restless, sometimes sleepless nights. We talked of her death, of her struggle, of our own struggle, discussed the memorial service, ordered family response cards, studied her estate, and began to divide up her things. I was horrified the day Anne's husband and son helped our stepsister carry her father's paintings out of mother's apartment, dismantling her life before she was dead. Only a few days later, I did the same thing having the few things picked up that I was shipping back to my home. Little by little, her apartment became less of her, except, of course, for the huge job my sister would do later of going through everything and distributing it throughout her family. By then, mother's things seemed to have lost their sense of her and were just things, except that now, as I wear her jacket or a piece of her jewelry or use her old cutting board in my kitchen, Sadness takes me over that I am alive and she is gone and I am using her things. Sitting at mother's bedside and staying in her retirement apartment complex left me increasingly intolerant of aging and dying. Her close friends are marvelous women and I loved having an occasional meal with them. I've been proud of mother for having the sense to choose and attract such splendid friends and they her. Yet I want to have the health and energy and determination to race around and do exactly as I please for the rest of my life. I want to be at 80 as I am at 60. Such ubris. 
I want to give up being so cautious, so morally scrupulous. Those days intensified in me the desire to kick over whatever traces hold me and fly off into the final adventures. Days later, I found coming back to my life exciting enough, even though I repeat consolingly to myself Dylan Thomas's plea not to go gentle into that good night. Now, I honestly rage, rage against the dying of the light. To remember that I have another life, a busy, busy, satisfying life, was the hardest thing to do. I thought I would become hardened in the wax of old age there in Oakmont before I got out. I am sure I look just like any other old woman as I walk to my plane, yet thinking to myself that I am much younger than other old people. Anne and I spent many an hour on either side of Mother's bed, holding one of her hands, talking to her, glancing up into each other's looks of weariness and anguish and tear-stained eyes. We didn't plan or schedule it that way. We would both just be drawn to sit with her or perhaps to sit with each other. That's where we were early one Saturday morning, Kay having called me to hurry over. Mother's breathing had become fast and shallow, the indication to increase the morphine, the hospice nurse said, so that she wouldn't feel like she were choking. The morphine slowed her breath down to about 35 breaths per minute. Unlike other days, she looked sick and corpse-like that morning as I came into her room. Most of these last weeks, she looked quite lovely, her beautiful face framed in thick gray hair against the pillowcase. We sat there knowing she was about to die and not knowing what that would be like for her or for us. We talked to her and I counted. Anne's husband stood and talked to her too, telling her that her two daughters were with her. Her breaths became quick gasps of air. We watched. Kay urged us to keep on talking to her. I told him I'd counted two minutes since her last breath, meaning I don't think she can hear us anymore. Life went out of this little body, this woman who was a dominant figure in our lives for all our years. We cried and kept on holding her hands and stroking her face. After a while, we readied ourselves to leave the room, and I noticed Anne folding and refolding the sheet on her side of the bed, tidying for us and for Mother from a place within her, surely mapped in our genes. The next few hours crawled as we waited for the hospice nurse, made calls, waited for the morticians to transport her body to the crematorium. We were in and out of her room, still talking to her, still patting her head, stroking her face. No longer was I afraid of a dead body. This form was still my mother. Anne picked out mother's favorite pink nightgown for her to wear on this final trip. We followed the gurney being pushed through the house toward the kitchen door. Mother's face was covered. The aide asked us if we wanted her face covered, and not knowing what the answer was, we said yes. I said to Anne and Kay, you always walk your guests out to their car. So we three walked through the garage and out onto the driveway with Mother's body. Anne's and my grief was enormous at this moment, this final letting go of the physical self of our mother. During this agonizing morning, I went out to walk around the winding street in front of Anne's house. Looking at these once familiar hills and houses, I could tell that the world had changed in some profound way. A butterfly fluttered along beside me, finally capturing my attention. Are you mother's spirit, I asked. For a few moments, I let that thought comfort me, accepted the butterfly soothing the raw wound of mother's death. Our stepsister and her husband arrived soon, insisting we all go out for lunch to get out of the house. In a few hours, we managed to get collected and go do this, joined by a stepbrother and his son. Before this, I went back to mother's apartment and walking through the hall was asked in passing by one of her friends, how is Ruth? She is dead, I answered, shocked at my own bluntness. I immediately tried to ameliorate my bad manners by explaining more gently to her the facts of that morning. My grief stands little ordinariness, so after we'd consumed plates of Mexican food, I asked each person to tell us their favorite memory of mother. The telling and the listening was tender time and began for us all this strange season of grief. A week later, on the eve of Mother's memorial service, I cried hot, bitter tears for myself, for the things about myself and my family I'd come to know in these past weeks, 
for all those things I'd pretended not to know that death demands I accept. I cried to realize that I was crying for myself and not for mother, crying for the unfinishedness, the imperfection, the ambivalence of life, even in the experience of my mother's dying and death. My friend Nan again cautioned me that I would come home and then have to come down and live among the mortals again. Dealing with death is being with the gods, she warned, and we have to crash to get back to Earth. Weeks later, I'm still struggling, sorting, sorting, remembering that Mother is not here to tell things to, to talk to by long distance, to plan things with, to be the strong, willful generation behind me. I wince to remember several times a day, my mother is dead. I spend some of her money on treats for my grown daughters and myself and my husband and feel strangely exhilarated to be a woman of some independent means. My friend Conrad said there'd be a liberation for me sooner or later. Now I get to be a grown-up, the oldest generation in my family. I explore that loss of innocence and that freedom unsteadily unsure of its eventual place in my life, walking through memories and years, surprised at how little I knew of death's power. Before we got to California, I called Mother one day and sitting at my piano played and sang old Christian science hymns into the telephone. She may have liked it, but indicated after each song that she had had enough by saying, that's fine, dear. I ignored her words and kept on singing and playing, trying to cross that chasm between us with memories. At her splendid memorial service, which was circles of family and friends, adults and children, reading favorite things or telling favorite memories, concluding with a grandson playing beneath my wings on the piano, surrounded by a chorus of grandchildren, I read her favorite hymn at least my memory of what was her favorite. <laughs> o Gentle Presence is its title, and the last verse reads, No snare, no fowler, pestilence or pain, no night drops down upon the troubled breast. When heaven's after smile, earth's teardrops gain, and mother finds her home and heavenly rest. Writing a book about women and aging one of the big issues is to face our own mortality and as you know everybody in this room knows that you're just you're just smack in the face of your own mortality every time a relative dies or every time you go to a funeral or uh, there are lots of ways that we are reminded of our own mortality I've just listened to some tapes by Helen Luke uh, she's a Jungian an old woman a wonderful old woman that lives in Wisconsin and a Jungian and in talking about, um, oh, this is from the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, she talks about, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. But in his old age, he wants to go off on another venture. His ego, you know, hasn't had enough. And he thinks he'll be famous and wonderful and adored again. And he consciously chooses not to do that. And she talks about consciously choosing to give up immortality and choosing mortality, which is, um, was helpful for me to know about my book, that my book gets to go where it wants to, and it isn't in this world to uh, make me feel important. <laughs> in the last 10 years, probably, I've been involved in progressive politics, and prior to that, I was active in my husband's various political campaigns. Um, I write and teach and hang out and do lots of community work. Teach values clarification, which is just a, simply a way of, of looking consciously at what's going on in your life and making choices around that and deciding where you can put your energy so you feel better about yourself, so you're, so you're living as close to the bone of who you are as you can. Uh, and then the women in aging classes. A friend and I do workshops on women, weight, and appearance issues, which is kind of a new, wonderful consciousness. Okay, let me do this thing that uh, I was in Colorado this summer and was interviewed by the Rocky Mountain Daily News about my book, and they were doing a story about have things really changed for political wives, and, and the woman talked to me for 45 minutes and used one and a half sentences. <laughs> so. As we drove home from Colorado, I thought, I really have something to say about this. 
and sat down and wrote it and, and thought maybe the Des Moines Register was a little more progressive than the Omaha World Herald. So I called them and they said, well, send it. You know, we can't say yes or no. And, and they printed it within a couple of weeks. So I was, you know, my ego self, still getting tickled about stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, this takes about five minutes, so you can, you can know that I won't be going on forever. Has the role of political wife changed? We are constantly told that it has, usually by those who want us to think that things are different for women in the 90s. The political wife is the new woman, we are told. Now that she has her own career, which can conveniently be put on hold, the lawyering and or the child raising homemaking, in order to be, if not constantly at her husband's side, on public view from early morning to late night, photographed doing good, smiling all the while. Have we simply accepted as political icon a new stereotype for political wives? What difference has having a career made in the public's perception of the wife of the candidate? None, I assure you. The female spouse is still an essential part of the male candidate's image. The reverse is not true. Did we need to see Martin Abzug, husband of former Congresswoman Bella? Or do we need to see James Schroeder, husband of current Congresswoman Pat, smiling, adoring, making constant public appearances and doing media interviews? To what purpose are the put together wife and children in completing the public image of the wholesome candidate? Beyond the junior high desire to be paired with a good looking girl the other boys will admire and covet, some reasons seem obvious to me for the candidate to trot out the wife and children. He must be married and therefore monogamous and not sexually promiscuous. The wife's appearance says the couple are getting along, not mired in affairs and other symptoms of marital discord. The candidate is not homosexual. The children of such marriages are bright, obedient, and well cared for. The candidate values the intact family and healthy children. The candidate can be affected by the values of women, the soft issues of childcare, stable homes, producing and nurturing life and compassion for others. We pretend that this happy family is involved and happy to be so in the male candidate's campaign. A lovely partnership, we say and feel. Feeding ourselves evidence of the myth we wish were true, our desire creating another myth. I cannot fathom the roots of our need to allow women to be lawyers and boutique owners and guard guardians of children's moral development as long as they stand beside their men. Generations of the patriarchy have seen families' emotional resources marshaled to the breadwinner's career, especially evident in families of preachers and politicians. The individual development of each member, while held in the nurturing bond of family, is often subsumed in the ambition of the male candidate. Although spouse Schroeder did move to Washington, D.C. with his congresswoman wife, and some men participate equally in parenting and homemaking functions, still the political process of campaigning for office appears firmly rooted in the soil of traditional appearance. Here is a memory I wish had faded. I am driving the campaign car, listening to a faithful campaign aide tell my Republican husband, who was running for Congress, that our oldest daughter, then in her early teens, was telling people that she was for McGovern for president, not Nixon. Whatever to do, we thought, how to stem this evidence of radicalism under our very roof, how to demonstrate that this daughter was indeed inside the campaign tent. How I wished we'd laughed and concentrated both on the campaign and Annie's emerging values. We lived for years, as my husband served in Congress and as Nebraska's governor, in that ambiguity so large, as large as the elephant called alcoholism sitting in the living room of the family in denial of its illness. That ambiguity is the call upon the male to run for political office and produce evidence of his family values while unable, by that very choice, to give hardly any time and only the leftover from campaigning energy to that very family. There are rewards. Our youngest Amy got a new stuffed animal at every county fair she accompanied her parents to and every hot dog and cotton candy she asked for. Moving to Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia, actually, wrenched our three daughters and ourselves out of our secure little world into one of wider horizons, gave us a crash course in government and more inclusive attitudes.
The girls winced at their pictures in the paper and on yearly Christmas cards and biennial postcards and learned how to live this strange life their parents had chosen, thinking it normal all the time. How we spent our political years, me campaigning most of the time and the girls whenever we could talk them into it, is what we thought we had to do. Obviously, it's what the Clintons and Gores and Bushes understand, too, about this ancient art of convincing others. God forbid that we should be real. Our lives in the public spotlight are much like Plato's shadows on the cave wall. I used to write a newsletter home to several thousand constituents, a lovely blue missive. It spoke of public life and how we loved it. My Mary laughed one day as I typed a newsletter in our Virginia kitchen and asked, what would it be like if you told the truth, Mother? <laughs> it's not that we lied. We simply lived by that code of not revealing our pain and dismay to the outside world. In the campaign of 1992, we still need the reassurance, if not from each other, from the appearance of candidates, wives, and children, that things are more all right than our own experience tells us. Da, da, da. Thank you.